We are from Pangatronics and we want to show you or tell you a bit about what's being next with the DMA buff API in the kernel, what we can do. And as already said in the abstract, um, we'll go through this with a really simple video pipeline, and uh, an example of a GStreamer pipeline. Um, then adding some hardware units in it, so to see what happens then, and yeah, the DMA have stuff, why we do it, how we do it, and what's the problem with that right, right now, and what we can do about it. So, yeah. We're using GStreamer as it's a really flexible framework for all kinds of multimedia stuff. You can just plug those elements together, form a pipeline, uh, may it be software, may it be you have some hardware elements in there, you can just as well use them from GStreamer and there's a lot of infrastructure already there to make it really easy to build those pipelines. So let's look at some simple software pipeline. Um, this is almost the simplest pipeline you could imagine to play some video. Um, on the one side, we have the UVC camera, which is just a USB camera. Um, on the other side, a DRM device to get something to a screen or, yeah. And in the middle, we just have a software scaler, which can also be a null element when it's just copying stuff around. So if you don't need any scaling in your pipeline. Um, how does it work? Um, on both sides, we have the concept of buffers. Um, buffers are just some logical elements where you can put in your video data or scan out your video data from. And they are always backed by some memory. So maybe system memory or some on-chip memory, whatever. Um, in this simple pipeline, we will just use this memory and map it into the user space. So this is all kernel space controlled. This is the user space, GStreamer pipeline element. And we just map the storage of the buffer and yeah, in this simple pipeline, we'll just copy stuff from one map to another to get it on the screen. Um, so let's see what happens if you add a hardware element in this pipeline. Just looks a bit more complicated. Um, yeah, we replace the software scaler with a hardware scaler, which is found on a lot of socks these days, so you can accelerate the scaling operation, so you don't have to use your precious CPU time for doing such things. And yeah, practically we get a lot more buffers. We have an output buffer of the UVC camera, the input buffer of the hardware scaler, the output buffer of the hardware scaler, and then finally the buffer where we gonna scan out from to get it on the display. So. What we have to do now in GStreamer to make this work is map all those buffers into user space and copy stuff around. So even we're not doing any real work on the CPU, like doing the scaling, because we are now doing this in hardware, we have to do two copies on the CPU, which might just as well be the same amount of computation you have to do. Uh, so what can we do about it? Um, the simple solution that came up a, a couple of years ago is using user pointers in the video for Linux API. So the, both those elements are controlled by the video for Linux API. And what we can do now is we get a user pointer from the mmap and stuff it back in when we are queuing the buffer to the hardware scaler. 
what happens now is the kernel part just resolves this pointer to the actual storage, locks the backing pages of the storage, and the uh, uh, hardware scaler can just read from the storage. So we're saving on those copy here. Um, yeah, the problem with that is the exporter of the buffer or the storage doesn't even know about that. There's now an importer that's using the memory. So all, um, there are logic in place to make sure the memory doesn't disappear while it is used by the hardware scaler, but nothing more than this. So, uh, and additionally to this, uh, the user pointer API is just a single subsystem solution. So it's only usable if both those elements are video for Linux elements. As soon as we go to the DRM part, we still need to map, copy, and uh, get to get the things to the screen. So this is where DMA buff comes into play. Um, DMA buff is uh, generic infrastructure which is cross subsystem in the Linux kernel. And what we can do now is we explicitly request to export this buffer from the exporter and user space gets handed and fire this crypto. And the advantage of this is the, you can now actually hang on information and operations onto this file descriptor. So when it gets imported to the hardware element, the scaler here, um, the kernel can actually extract the DMA buffer with, us, with its operations from the FD again and uh, can call some operations on this. So uh, yeah, we come to that later. But, um, and as you can see, uh, it's cross subsystem, so you can just export the same handle from video for Linux API here on as the exporter, pass it into user space, and then pass it into the DRM subsystem and make a frame buffer from it. So you save both copies. Great. So what happens when you pass the FD into some importing element is it attached to the DMA buff. Um, this is just calling DMA buff attach. And what happens now is this uh, operation goes back to the exporter and the exporter gives you some attachment. Uh, so the exporter now knows that there's an importing element that's interested in the buffer. So uh, you, if you're no longer interested in the buff buffer at all, you just detach from it to tell the exporter, okay, I don't want to do anything with this buffer again. Um, yeah, that's the one-time operations. You get handed the buffer, you attach to it, and if you're not interested anymore, you just detach. Now, every time you want to really access the memory from the DMA buff, you have to do a map attachment. Um, and that's just passing in those DMA attachment you got, and you get back a scatter getter table. Um, and the scatter getter table is just a collection of all those pages backing the buffer you got handed. And Every time you access the buffer, you map it, you do your DMA with your hardware engine, and then you unmap it to tell the exporter, okay, I'm not doing DMA with this buffer right now. So all this sounds like a really good idea in principle, and really easy to do. So we're saving all those copies, we're just passing around some file descriptors, which is a known thing in the user space, but what happens if the buffer or the, the devices 
using the DMA buffers have different constraints on their memory access patterns. Um, there could be different DMA windows, so it's not really happening on the embedded systems right now, but if you go back to the PC where you have some ISA cards which can only address the lowest 16 MB of memory <coughs> and then some PCI cards which maybe can only access the first gigabyte of memory and, and so on. So you could have devices that can only access different memory portions. Um, so they actually cannot use a buffer that's handed them from a device that allocated a buffer in another memory region. Another uh, constraint is contiguous versus pages mem page memory. Um, many devices can just access the DMA buffer as one big block, so it really has to be physically contiguous in memory because you have no MM MMU in between the device and the memory. So you cannot use page memory. Or even different MMU page sizes. If you think about I.O. MMUs, there might be some that are using large pages for uh, the little performance benefit. So you need chunks of memory that are physically contiguous that may not be your system memory page size. So the Really common restrictions we see today on embedded systems are devices that are not able to do scatter gather DMA on their own. So they can't just fetch from different portions of memory, but only you have a start address and a size, and it fetches only the linear chunk. Um, also, there are more. Uh, many times no I.O. MMUs available which could overcome this uh, limitation. So DMA buffers in general have to be physically contiguous in a lot of places on embedded systems. That's not really a problem uh, uh, because we have the CMA, contiguous memory allocator, so you can just make sure you get contiguous memory for these devices that needs them. But what happens if you have a mixed system, like this one? Again, a UVC camera, which can do scatter gather DMA, and so it allocates its buffers as page memory that is not physically contiguous. And then we try to export the buffer, import it again in the hardware scaler, and the hardware scaler can only use contiguous memory. It now tries to attach to the buffer and gets a scatter getter table that has more than one entries. So it can't work with that. So here the pipeline will break because there's no way this can work right now. Um, yeah, and now to our solution, which is just transparent backing storm migration. And as I don't want to take the fame for this, because Philip implemented all this, I'll With him standing it. behind my back, so. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, we have some prerequisites for this, because before we can do transparent migration of any useful sort, we have to know something about the constraints of the devices which are involved. And uh, one of those uh, constraints, which is already commonly known, is the DMA mask inside every device, struct device, which uh, was the, the bits that the actual DMA could, the address bits that the DMA of this device could drive. But on uh, the SOC systems that we are involved with, uh, this is usually thus, uh, just 32 bits all set, so uh, not important. But there's already more. Um, inside the struct device, we have the struct device uh, DMA parameters, which had uh, already the um, properties which are not printed in bold, the max segment size and segment boundary mask, which are uh, properties related to the IM MMUs. And uh, for our prototype, we have uh, just added two more, which is the minimum segment size, which can basically be used uh, to get uh, contiguous chunks of a minimum size. For example, if you have a, f a 64K MMU, you can put 64K in there and you will get uh, 
pages of 64 which are contiguous physically in memory. And uh, the max segments, which we right now only use to put either one in there or in max, which either means you have a paged um, device or you have a device which needs physically contiguous memory. So if you put a one in there, there will be only one entry in the scatter gather table, and uh, all devices which need physically contiguous memory can use this. Okay, and uh, now that we can describe those constraints on devices, we need uh, a way to allocate some memory which fulfills those constraints. And um, there we traditionally used the DMA IPA to get uh, contiguous chunks of memory and um, we request a size of memory and we have some uh, parameters, the DMA attributes, which also includes the protection flags. Uh, and we get out of this function a void pointer, which is a, a contiguous virtual mapping uh, in kernel space or some uh, kind of, of uh, cookie, depending on which attributes were put in there. And uh, DMA address T, this is a physical start address in device space. So in case you have no IOMU, it's just the physical address of the memory that is, uh, that is given back by this API. So it's not possible to get generic get-together memory, page memory that is somehow distributed out of this API. And uh, we want to change that to have a, a single point where we can put, un, put in our constraints um, and then get out memory that is suitable for the devices which are involved in this exchange. And um, we implemented this right now as a test case only for ARM, only for um, enabled contiguous memory allocators, so it's really just a proof of concept. And uh, what changed is we put in there a scatter gather table to be filled, and we put in there the constraints that the device gave us, for example, but separately. So we could pull the constraints out of the device, but we can also have one device uh, request memory with arbitrary constraints. And uh, the other big change is that we don't get back the DMA address right away because this memory is not allocated for just one device, but maybe we need to map it to two different devices and depending on whether you have an IOMMU in between them, you will get different DMA addresses and it does not uh, get the virtual kernel mapping right away. So in case we just want to take a buffer out of one hardware module and put it into another, we don't necessarily need the virtual mapping at all. And this uh, scatter gather table coming out of this is uh, just a useful uh, structure to describe memory which is um, well, distributed. So you have a list and the page or link uh, entry contains some magic bits in the first two bits, which is either the table is, is at its end or it is a link to the page, um, struct page. And um, optionally, you can fill the DMA address and it has the length of, of this part, so it will be able to describe um, pages which are consecutive with just one element. So in case you have a contiguous memory, you have a scatter gather table with a scatter list with just ele one element pointing to the first page with the length of the contiguous uh, region. Okay, and uh, now that we have this, we need a way to get back the virtual address if needed for the CPU, and we need a way to get the physical address or the, the yes, the DMA address cookie for, for the device to be able to use this RAM. And this API is already existing right now. So um, if we have the scatter list out of the scatter gather table that we got back from the new API, we can just call DMA map SG and we will get back a scatter list with filled in DMA address entries. So this can be used right away by the device. And we had to add a new function which will just take the scatter gather table. Um, the protection flags now can be set at this point when we are mapping, depending on whether we want to have the mappings cached, right combined, something like that. And uh, we'll get back a scatter gather table, uh, we'll get back a virtual mapping into the kernel space 
which is uh, virtually contiguous. Um, now, that we have this method of getting memory that fulfills constraints which are given by the devices involved, we need a way to uh, have all devices um, pool their constraints and find out which constraints we have to fulfill for buffers which need to be used by both devices. And the way to do this is to check at attachment time if the current storage, if the driver already has allocated memory, um, is compatible with the attachment. And if yes, we can just uh, return the scatter gather table that is already existing. And if it's not compatible, we have to wait until all other involved um, importers, which might have already mapped this memory, unmap this, so they are not using it anymore, and then we can re reallocate the storage. Still wait while this importer, this new importer, is waiting for its attachment. And after we reallocate the storage, we can... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So uh, I just wanted to explain how the reallocation is going to work. Um, first, we have to s try to find the DMA parameters compatible with all of the attached devices, and we have uh, added a small function for this, which just takes uh, an array, so this is the number of the array elements in there, of those DMA parameters of all devices, and um, it well pushes them together and finds, for example, the, the, the minimum of the max size and the maximum of the min segment size and the minimum of the, the number of entries that all the devices uh, support and gives out a new set of constraints which all of the devices involved should support. And if this is not possible, it will give back an error and we are back again where we started before we started implementing all this. So if we have a buffer exporter and multiple exporters, uh, importers, um, we can start with trying to fulfill the constraint of all involved devices. If this is not possible, there might be a second way, um, which is we just wait for all involved parties to unmap the buffer, and then with, uh, when one device tries to map this buffer, we can just use the constraints of this one device and the exporter. So another device which might be also attached will not have access to this anymore, but uh, at the moment it didn't request it, so it's no problem. We can just migrate and let this other device use the memory. Um, and if this is also not possible, as a last resort, it would be possible to just throw away the constraints of the exporter and just use the constraints of the importer. So it's always possible by copying by the CPU, for example, to get this buffer to the importer somehow. And it's all transparent from, from, from user space then. So the parameters returned by this function are then used uh, to allocate new storage with the DMI, uh, DMA API uh, returning the new scatter gather table. Then we have to move the content. We have a new buffer, we have the old buffer. We copy the content over. So um, the simplest way to do this is just map both buffers into CPU memory space, do a mem move, and um, if the exporter itself has facilities to move, for example, with the GPU behind MMU, can use splitting. So uh, the exporter always has the choice to implement it in a more efficient way. And in theory, it would be also possible to use dedicated on-chip DMA engines, uh, like s some system DMA, to do the migration in a more efficient way. Now, after we have migrated into the new storage, we can just return the SG table, which we got from this allocation function, and after copying into it, just free the old buffer and uh, have whatever the user space wanted the involved elements to do, continue merrily with the new buffer, which is compatible with hopefully both exporter and importer. And now, I talked about copying a lot. Um, the question is, why isn't this that slow? And the reason is any sane user space, like GStreamer, for example, is reusing allocated buffers. Actually, this is a, a main concept of video for Linux also. So at the beginning, you allocate the buffers needed on the devices. You uh, queue them into the devices, let them fill them, dequeue, queue into the next device, and let them use the memory, and then have them 
buffers go back. So in our case, if the buffers come from the first device, the UVC, which is requesting itself a page memory, which is not compatible with our simple hardware scaler, we will have buffers that are not uh, that the hardware scaler cannot read, so we have to copy them. But in this case, we have three buffers that we are just uh, pushing around, so we will have to copy three times at the beginning. And after this, we have buffers which are compatible, which are contiguous for the hardware scaler, and they get reused, and uh, we will not have to copy anymore. And uh, well, again, all of this without any user space <coughs> involvement so far, except that user space has to use the DMA buffer facilities that are available. Okay, there are some strange corner cases, for example, for devices which are not overlapping at all in their DMA parameters, be it because their uh, DMA windows do not match or, well, because one of them can, uh, has a fixed page size of 64K and the other can for some reason not read that. Um, it will still work, we will just copy every time. So then there's one, more extreme corner case, which might be devices with memory not accessible to the CPU and no way to migrate to <coughs> CPU memory on their own. But then I would ask you, do you know any such hardware? I don't. And even if you do know such hardware, why do you want to share the buffer? So okay. if the hardware can sensibly share the buffer, this uh, method will, will give some improvement uh, over the case before, as in it works at all. Okay, and uh, one possible optimization, well, this is a, possible, is a possible optimization that you want to do very much, is just to delay <coughs> the allocation of the buffers. Um, as Lucas said, we have the attachment and the mapping, which are separate, so there's no need to allocate the buffer at the attachment already, or allocate the buffer before this. You can just map the buffer when is the, the first user tries to map it and tries to write some data into it. So if from user space you have a way to um, present all involved drivers with this buffer before doing the first map, you can already get together all the constraints you need and then allocate the buffer in the first place with the right constraints. So there will be no copying at all if user space is enhanced to uh, first show the buffers around before starting this pipeline. Um, yeah. Okay, and I think this is for, for the talk. If you have any questions so far, feel free, and I will do a quick demonstration. I hope this works. I'm not sure. Any questions? If our test hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hopefully soon. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's pretty invasive in the DMA API to get this new method to allocate things and get the CPU mapping. Uh, but yeah, we have to implement it for more than ARM. We have to implement it for x86 and whatever to reasonably get this into mainline kernel. But actually, the battery died. I will have to switch oh. over here. Yeah, so we hope to get some patches out soon. Any other questions? No, in kernel API. That's the thing about all this. It's completely transparent to user space. The, the user space only have to use the concept of DMA buffs. And a lot of user space is already is using DMA buffs to share buffers between <coughs> DMA devices. So is the DMA buff some kind of opaque structure for the user space? It's a file handle. Yeah. It's DFD and you just pass it around and pass it into the appropriate I.O. controls to the kernel. So you just need to use that and everything other is completely transparent to user space. All the nasty details, how the memory is laid out and such is completely hidden from user space. I'm sorry, can you get me console on there? Oh, God. 
geht das nicht. No, he doesn't like it. I'm sorry, my, my laptop battery died and I, I don't know yeah, what it, this thing is doing. It's particularly and spectacular. Okay, you, so what, what you would have seen, if I would have played <laughs> back this demo, is the system would have booted with a black screen, I would have started the pipeline and you would have seen live video from the USB camera played back on the screen, nothing more. <laughs> and so okay. it's just the camera is allocating buffers which are paged, and the first three flames are copied, and because the system is uh, idle otherwise, the copying is very fast, so after this copy, you will see no more than just the camera pushing the <laughs> pixels to the screen. I'm, I'm sorry. When yeah. you say it's transparent to user space, uh, you still have to know the DMA capabilities of your camera and of your scale where you're going to build the kernel? No, this will be inside the drivers. Yeah, the, the kernel driver will know the capabilities of the devices, like it's always been. And yeah, user space doesn't need to know about it. It's just passing around buffers. So the exporter creates this DMA buff, exports the file descriptor, the user imports the file descriptor and converts the file descriptor back to the DMA buff and then calls operations on this DMA buff. And from the DMA buff, which has a list of all attached attachments of all users, uh, the DMA buff can just check all users for their constraints and then do something useful with it. Okay. Uh, what, what needs to be changed in uh, DMA-capable drivers? Uh, is it the allocation of the buffers only? Mostly, yes. So you, you need to set up the structure we've shown, the, the, re, the device DMA parameters that's not always filled right now for all devices, so you need to fill this. And yeah, then just use the new way to allocate the buffers. And yeah, then for the migration stuff, you, you need to do a bit more. But yeah, basically, for if you're just importing buffers, it's nothing more than filling the structure. The exporter will do all the heavy lifting, and yeah. We, you have to do all this stuff. We, we hope to get some useful helper functions for this so the common path of migrating with the CPU will be easy to do for you as the exporters. On, on, what, what, on what platform did you start uh, this uh, This here is an old IMX53 Cortex A8 class in gigahertz. Yeah. So. It's, it's uh, interesting just for platforms where you might have mixed uh, systems which can, uh, mixed IPs which can only use uh, contiguous memory and others which can somehow scale together. This is, for, for example, interesting for everything that has simple uh, uh, hardware decoders and GPUs, and you want to push the hardware decoder and CPU memory back and forth. Please. Yeah. Uh, the question was uh, what kind of improvement we see. So um, the improvement can be from nothing at all. If you have enough memory bandwidth available and the system is idle, you do not want to use your CPU, the, the speed is enough to use, do 30 FPS VGA or something. But as soon as you increase your, your uh, buffer size or you want to use the CPU while playing video, uh, the, the change can be a works or it does not work at all. So as soon as you stall because your memory bandwidth is filled, you will get, I don't know, things like 50%. So for USB camera, USB 1, probably have way more memory bandwidth than USB bandwidth. Yeah, for, for this simple example. Yeah, right. 
Well, with? it depends. If you have a fast hmm. USB and you have a use case where you want to use all of the memory bandwidth of, of your CPU, and for some reason you want to get uh, the frames quickly out of the camera, so you want low latency, then it's something which is really interesting. If you just want to play back a high resolution USB video, maybe you're better served with the USB camera which encodes itself and then just put MJPEG or H.264 over USB, but then you have latency. So there are use cases for this, maybe not everywhere. Yeah. Actually, the, the uh, other method to handle all of this is uh, do what the Android people are trying, which is this memory allocator, like Ion, for example, uh, where you have a general, uh, general place which knows beforehand where your buffers have to come from. But we wanted to avoid this. So for yeah. development, it's, it's just easier to pipe everything together. And maybe it doesn't work uh, as fast as it possibly can for the first few frames if you don't do everything right. But at least it works at all. So it's yeah. uh, mostly interesting for bring up for us. And if you then have a proper user space, so we hope to get patches into GStreamer eventually, which can do this. This will be fast all the time. Yeah. The thing is, uh, the Ion allocator in Android assumes all this knowledge about DMA constraints and whatever is into user space. And we really want to keep this knowledge into the kernel and all those fuzzy bits. And yeah. It's really easier for the user space developer if you're just dealing with a generic interface to the kernel and don't have to worry if it... Yeah, you, as we have shown, you have some uh, possibilities to optimize things. If you are passing around the handles before and before you using them, you can delay the allocation and make it even faster, but yeah. Basically, it will just work if you plug things together like you do in GStreamer or other applications. And also, for generic user spaces like uh, the Western Compositor, we have the same problem. We have a GPU that's doing the compositing and putting, spitting out paged memory because it has an I.O. MMU. So the memory there gets allocated in paged form. And then we want to put it on the screen. And especially on our Freescale hardware, the scanout driver can only work with contiguous memory. So yeah, you have to have a way to just pass the handles around and make it all work in the kernel somehow. And it's really easier that way than going into Western, tell Western, OK, we may want to put this buffer on the screen. Please tell the GPU driver to allocate it in contiguous memory and uh, then get out the right memory. So yeah, you basically don't need any knowledge in the user space for this to work. Uh, we think this is a real advantage over what is there currently. Any more questions? Okay, then. Well, thank, thank you for your time. time.